Is mass murder an act of terrorism? All right, this is a question that's being posed um, in the different social and news medias here as of late, the last few handful of years, and I think it's a valid question. Um, to cut to the chase, let me tell you what the research that we're going to discuss finds. It finds that um, if you accept the definition of terrorism, and if you accept the four metrics of terrorism, um, that four in every five mass murders are actually acts of terrorism, whether they're domestic or overseas, doesn't matter. Um, but mostly we're focusing on domestic here. If you accept that, uh, then what they found was that, again, something along the 80%, just north of the 80% mark, um, met at least three and as many as all four metrics um, and then otherwise fit into the definition of terrorism. Okay, so in discussing that, the first thing we need to do is we need to define terrorism. And let's go ahead and admit right here and right now that this is somewhat contentious. Not everyone agrees on the definition of terrorism. Here are a couple out there. Um, one definition, terrorism, noun. One, the unlawful use of violence and intimidation, especially against unarmed civilians, in the pursuit of political, social, or religious goals. That's one definition. Whereas the Department of Defense, the U.S. Department of Defense, defines terrorism as this the calculated use of unlawful violence or threat of unlawful violence to inculcate fear intended to coerce or intimidate governments or societies in the pursuit of goals that are generally political, religious, or ideological. So those two aren't really remarkably different. And that's why I grabbed, uh, you know, your basic, um, gosh, did I get that from Britannica or Webster's or something? And then I went and I grabbed the one from DOD. And of course, they're remarkably similar. Similar DOD is just a bit more long-winded about it. That's the definition that we're operating off of. Again, that's not universally agreed to, but uh, I think most of us default to that. Unlawful use of violence and intimidation, especially against arm, unarmed civilians, in the pursuit of political, social, or religious go goals. What do the studies tell us? From uh, a study published in January 2017, and by the way, I will try to remember to link these studies and references down below in the description of this video. I don't have any books out here because I wasn't referencing them. So let's go with it. A study published in January 2017 by the National Institute of Justice investigated 71 lone actor terrorist attacks and compared these to 115 lone mass murderer attacks um, here in the United States. The study found no difference in socio-demographic of the attackers or their desire to commit violent acts that would be, in turn, highly publicized. The researchers concluded that the attackers' intent differed for their violent acts. Lone terrorists committed um, their violent acts in expression of and commitment to a political or religious ideology, whereas other mass murderers acted out of personal feelings of having been wronged by an individual or a group. So in this study, they separate the intent, the attacker's intent, into um, political or religious ideology versus mass murderers who are act out of personal feelings of having been wronged by an individual or a group. In a paper by Dr. Lance Hunter of Augustus University uh, School of Political Science, Dr. Hunter writes, quote, we argue that it's very important to consider these acts of domestic terrorism if they fit the definition, because it's easier for governments to monitor individuals that may possibly carry out these attacks, end quote. Hunter acknowledges the objection to government overreach that threatens to violate American citizens' human right to privacy, and so therefore what he's saying is we get it that by, by acknowledging this, naturally there is an emotional reaction saying, whoa, 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 that may or may not be the case, but I don't want you to allow the government to overreach into our privacy merely based on that. And Hunter recognizes this. Furthermore, Hunter admits that the government monitoring isn't a silver bullet um, a solution. Quote, it's not 100% guarantee that these attacks will be prevented, but the likelihood will be much greater. It could have possibly been prevented. And we've seen this throughout a lot of cases in our research. 
end quote, with better monitoring. Hunter continues, quote, individuals at times tend to have a preconception that terrorism tends to be something that's carried out by ISIS or Al-Qaeda or a group of organizations such as that. And if it is an individual outside of these organizations, it may not be considered terrorism. But when you look at the actions, they clearly fit the criteria for terrorism, end quote. So Hunter's objecting to the previous study. He's saying, and eh, not so much. These previous studies that said, let's separate the intent into these nice neat cans of religious political and I've been offended. He said, no, they're, they're, much, they're much tighter than that. They're, they overlap a great deal. And that leads to the question, all right, then wait, wait, hold on. We've defined terrorism, but what's the criteria for terrorism. In a October 2021 uh, research publication by the Behavioral Science of Terrorism and Political Aggression, Hunter et al. He has, I'm sorry, I forget all the different names, but uh, several other professors conducted, collaborated in this study to analyze 105 mass murder attacks by lone actors in the United States. They found that 39% fit all four criteria as defined, we'll get to that in a second, and 43% fit three criteria of terrorist attacks. The researchers asserted that mass murders are an act of terrorism if they meet these following four criteria. One, attacks involve a political, religious, ideological, or social motivation. Two, attacks are not motivated by monetary or sexual gain. Three, attacks intend to reach a larger audience by the horrific nature of the act. And four, attacks involve a manifested enemy identity to target. Now let me say that again. We'll go over the four of those, but I think this is very important. Of the 105 lone um, attacker incidents that they studied here in the United States, 39% fit all four of those criteria. Another 43% uh, percent fit at least three of those criteria. Others fit two or less, but they didn't consider this. And now, eh, well, that's our threshold. If it's just two or less, and we're not going to necessarily consider these, it's unknown. You know, what if you have two? Well, it could be an unknown. Is it really an act of terrorism or not? But when you add 39 and 43 together, if I'm doing my math correctly, that's 82 percent. What that means again here is that essentially just over 80 percent, or four out of every five, um, mass murders by lone attackers. This isn't conspiracy with other attackers. This is lone attackers. Four out of five of them do fit the definition of terrorist attack and fit the four metrics, uh, at least three of the four metrics of a terrorist attack. So let's look at those metrics one more time. The attacks involve a political, okay, religious, ideological, or social motivation. And I think political and religious uh, are pretty clear. Ideological, well, let's talk about eco-terrorists, right? Um, our ideology is to save the world, so we're gonna kill humans or destroy property or whatever it is. That's ideological, but it's certainly not necessarily political, nor is it necessarily religious. Social motivation, uh, social justice. We've seen Antifa and BLM, um, you know, uh, crying for social justice. I would say we might fit in that uh, KKK and neo-Nazis, uh, at least ideologically, if not in a social motivation. So that's the number one. Attacks involve a political, religious, ideological, or social motivation. Number two, attacks are not motivated by monetary or sexual gain. It's not a power play in that sense. We're not kidnapping people for a ransom. We're not robbing them. You know, this isn't a sexual attack. Three, attacks intend to reach a larger audience by the horrific nature of the act. Now, that actually resonates really well with me. Um, I think this is often missed, and it's something that was really struck home to me in my military training, that in a very real sense, Acts of terrorism are intended as a communication tool, at least in part. They are intended as a communication tool, and the way you do that is you attack you know, the shocking nature of the violence. Who do you attack? The most vulnerable or the most political? But you always have to one-up the next one, you know? If they killed six, you've got to kill 10 or more, you know? It's one of, if they killed 100, you have to kill 500. And so 
the shocking nature of these are intended to take our cause and communicate that to a broader, hopefully global audience. That's the intention of terrorism. So number three, it's intended to reach a larger audience. And number four, the attacks involve a manifested enemy identity to target. That is, you still have to say, okay, I'm really angry about these things. Who am I going to attack? And so in their mind, they must manifest this, ooh, they are the enemy, they are not me, they're unlike me, I can, I'm justified in um, you know, targeting them for violence. That's a little deep, let's take a breath here and step back and say, okay, well let's look at some vignettes, that is, let's look at some uh, anecdotal evidence. This is more just to get our head around those four definitions and to look at things that we may have thought as um, you know, just violent, horrific, violent crimes and redefine them as, well, wait, that is an act of terrorism under that definition and under those four metrics. Let's look. Bath, Michigan. In May 1927, Andrew Kehoe detonated two of three bombs at the school in Bath, Michigan, killing 44, including 38 children and five adults, plus himself. He was angry about the cost of the new school that kept increasing property taxes of his farm. A year before the massacre, Kehoe had stopped farming. He plotted his crime for months. Point one, Kehoe did not rob, ransom, or rape his victims. Point two, Kehoe was politically motivated due to his perceived injustice of higher taxes. Point three, Kehoe manifested the school staff and community children as his identified enemy. Point four, Kehoe demonstrated an intent to reach a broader public audience through terror. Let's get to that. Kehoe's motivation appeared to be political. A sign on Kehoe's fence read, quote, criminals are made, not born, end quote. He was angry about increased property tax for the sake of the school, and he attempted through legitimate means to settle his grievances in the years before. When he failed, seeing himself as the victim, Kehoe planted two bombs beneath the floors of the school. One bomb failed to go off, thereby decreasing the magnitude of death that Kehoe had intended. A half hour later, as rescue attempts were being made, Kehoe drove up in a pickup truck uh, that he had fashioned into an improvised explosive device. He set it off, killing himself and several others. This this remains the single bloodiest attack from 1927 in Bath, Michigan. This remains the single bloodiest attack on a school in U.S. history. Vignette number two, Edmond, Oklahoma. In August 1986, U.S. Postal Carrier Patrick Sherrill entered the post office in Edmond, Oklahoma to kill 14 and wound six more before committing suicide. The previous day, he had been reprimanded by two supervisors that he had to, quote, shape up or possibly lose his job. Number one, Sherrill did not rob, ransom, or rape his victims. Number two, Sherrill was socially motivated by an insult to his person and sought revenge. Number three, Sherrill manifested the postal staff as his identified enemy. Cheryl's motivation appeared to be social. He had been a loner with no romantic partners all his life. He was disagreeable and couldn't keep a job. And he exhibited anger at everyone, even neighborhood animals, in which he apparently would torture. While Cheryl's initial victim was one of the supervisors who had reprimanded him the day before, Cheryl targeted and terrorized the co-workers randomly and indiscriminately. Fits three of the four. Vignette number three, New York City. In March 1990, Julio Gonzalez set fire to the Happy Land night fire, uh, nightclub, killing 87 people. Gonzalez had gotten into an argument with his girlfriend at the club where she worked. Bouncers physically removed Gonzalez at 3 a.m. He departed angrily and returned at 3.40 a.m. with a uh, gas can filled with gas and deliberately set the fire so as to trap the staff and customers in a raging inferno. Gonzalez did not rob, ransom, or rape his victims. Gonzalez was socially motivated by an insult to his person and sought revenge. Gonzalez uh, manifested the nightclub staff as his identified enemy. Gonzalez appears to have been insulted by his girlfriend's rejection and being removed from the nightclub. As a Cuban immigrant during the Mariel boat lift a few years earlier, he had not adjusted well to employment or social life in the U.S., and Gonzalez sought revenge out of a sense of social justice. After they captured them, he, this is what he told investigators. Vignette number four, Huntsville, Alabama. In February 2010, Harvard-educated professor Amy Bishop opened fire with a handgun upon faculty meeting at the University of Alabama in Huntsville, killing three and wounding three more. She was angry because she had been denied tenure as a professor by the university. 
Bishop did not rob, ransom, or rape her victims. She was ideologically motivated by a perceived injustice and sought revenge. Bishop manifested university peers as her identified enemy. Bishop's motivation appeared to be ideological. Uh, she viewed herself as the victim, and the university system was the oppressor. Bishop directed her violence randomly against 12 of her colleagues in a violent act of terrorism that murdered three and maimed three more. It still fit three of the four definitions. Vignette number five, Isla Vista, California. In May 2014, 22-year-old Elliot Roger went on a three-day rampage using knife and handgun uh, to kill six people and wound one other. His sexual advances had been rejected by multiple different women, and through social media, Roger expresses anger at being a, quote, victim. Roger did not rob ransom or rape his victims. Roger was ideologically motivated due to repeated insults, or perceived insults anyway, to his person by multiple different women over many different years. Roger manifested the campus community as identified enemy. Roger demonstrated an intent to reach a broader public audience through terror. Roger's motivation was very clearly articulated as an ideological revenge against women. He wrote, quote, you forced me to suffer all my life. Now I will make you all suffer. I waited a long time for this, end quote. Roger directed his violence fairly randomly, initially targeting his three male roommates and then killing two sorority women um, off campus while wounding a third. Then Roger fired into an off-campus shopping district, killing another random male, his sixth murder victim. He demonstrated all four criteria. Um, under the definition and the criteria for terrorism. We're back to New York City with Vignette 6. In October 2017, Sefolo Sayapov drove his rented truck down a bicycle path near the new One World Trade Center in New York, killing eight people and injuring 12 others. An immigrant to the U.S. from Uzbekistan, Sayapov left written statements that his attack was retaliation for mistreatment of Muslims by the U.S. Sayapov did not rob, ransom, or rape his victims. Sayapov was religiously motivated due to perceived insults to Islam. Sayapov manifested the American citizens as his identified enemy. And Sayapov demonstrated an intent to reach a broader public audience through terror. Sayapov's motivations were articulated in writing. He claimed to be acting on behalf of ISIS. There are six vignettes, each one of them offering us um, anecdotal evidence of not just the definition of terrorism, which we'll get to in a second, we'll get back to that, but also meeting at least three. Three of them met three of the four criteria. Three of those six vignettes met all four of those criteria. And so I do agree with Hunter et al. that says, look, if, if this is what terrorism is, and we can agree to these criteria, you have to conclude that 82% of lone violent attackers inside the United States that conduct mass murder are in fact terrorists. Let's do a little bit of a hermeneutical analysis of the text. Let's go back to those two definitions. Unlawful use of violence and intimidation, especially against unarmed civilians in the pursuit of political, social, or religious goals. Well, that unarmed really stands out. Number two, this is the DOD. Uh, definition. The calculated use of unlawful violence, yep, that, there's that again, or threat of unlawful violence to inculcate fear, that is the intended outcome, intended to coerce or intimidate governments or societies in the pursuit of goals that are generally political, religious, or ideological. In all six of these, ideologically motivated, the criminals see themselves as a victim. Right or wrong, that's how they view themselves. It's unlawful violence. The criminals use deliberate means of mass casualties. Deliberate means in every single case. And we're going to break those down, uh, the mass casualty weapons, in just a minute. They inculcate fear. The intent is revenge against society or an identity group. And they are unarmed civilians. The criminals target vulnerable populations in each and every case. Now the question is, are all violent crimes forms of terrorism? And I don't think we can conclude, yes, all violent uh, crimes, even all violent mass murder crimes are terrorism. Again, almost 20% or roughly one in five are not. They're clearly not. Um, they don't meet the definition and or they don't meet enough of the criteria. 
Violent crimes are committed for personal gain of either monetary value, um, say robbery or ransom, or to demonstrate illicit power through rape, intimidation, or vandalism of property. In rare cases, the criminal act satisfies a narcissistic sociopathic desire for abhorrent behavior, um, ranging from minor theft and vandalism up to serial torture and murder. In each of these cases, the criminal seeks self-preservation and hides their identity so that they can continue their crimes. When mass murderers do not seek financial gain or illicit power, and indeed often lack even a measure of self-preservation when committing the act, sometimes even committing suicide during the act, we may be correct in recognizing these crimes as an act of terrorism. So the question is, is mass murder an act of terrorism? And we can say in the vast majority, um, something like 80% of the times, yes. But this is a strategic perspective, so that begs the next question. How do we protect ourselves from terrorism? And when we answer that, I'm not going to look at the tactical operational perspective. I'm going to look at the strategic perspective. And there are both proactive and reactive means of protecting ourselves. Proactive, harden the most vulnerable targets harden the most vulnerable segments of our population. We've seen repeated, here in the United States, repeated terrorist attacks against elementary schools, specifically against elementary schools and, and less so against, let's say, high schools, because elementary students can't get away. And we've refused to arm uh, you know, personnel in protecting these elementary students and schools. We've refused to put in effective barriers um, and targeting surveillance and detection systems. Um, so elementary schools, the number one thing I'd say we have to start hardening. Shopping malls and districts and shopping districts seem to be anywhere, you know, even um, concert venues or bars, anywhere you have a mass population. Um, that too, particularly unarmed and without protections against, barrier protections against vehicles and fire. When we don't harden those targets, they become vulnerable to terrorist attacks. And lastly, I will say that um, a disproportionate number happen on college campuses. And this one seems like the most readily addressed, once again with barrier systems and surveillance systems of who's on campus and who isn't. But also we're dealing with adults. On college campus, you're an adult. Why aren't you capably armed um, and trained? And that doesn't necessarily mean firearms, although it certainly can involve that. Why are they not armed and trained to respond? In hardening the targets, it would be advisable to recognize the primary tools of terrorism. Okay, let's break this down. Fire is one of the oldest tools known to humankind. We don't even know when we started using it. Was it just 300,000 years ago? Was it literally 600,000 years ago? We don't know, but Pretty much as soon as we started using it for, oh, I don't know, heating and cooking, we started using it as a weapon. So it is one of the most effective and deadly weapons we wield. Um, and that still holds true today. The deadliest mass casualty threat is fire. Consider the September 11th attacks in New York City and Washington, D.C. in 2001. We had almost 3,000 killed and another 2,000 wounded. And what were those airplanes but great big vehicles full of fire and fuel. And so remarkably effective. And you can see this uh, time and time again, not just the Happy Land fire, unfortunately. Fire is the number one mass casualty uh, threat as a weapon. Bombs come in a close second for um, deadly mass casualty weapons as a threat. Bombs, of course, are used repeatedly. One of the deadliest bombings known in recent history was in Somalia in 2017, uh, killing 587 and wounding 316 other people. Vehicle attacks are the third most deadly uh, mass casualty producing weapon. We've seen, uh, unfortunately, vehicle attacks here in America and Europe and Canada and other places. Um, one of the most horrific was in Nice, France in 2016, where 86 people were killed and 452 were wounded. Um, and then lastly, but certainly not least, uh, small arms and bladed weapons are probably the fourth deadliest tool of terrorism. Um, and they're, and the, what I need to say about small arms, uh, firearms, and bladed weapons is that they are 
are very readily available. I don't mean that fire isn't read readily available or vehicles aren't readily available, but these are easier to hide than bombs, vehicles, and fire. And so they are more pronounced in their use. When I say bladed weapons, people want to dismiss that. No, bladed weapons often are every bit, if not more, deadly than small arms, particularly handguns. In Yunnan, China in 2014, uh, knives, not even machetes, just simple knife attacks resulted in 33 dead and 130 wounded. So devastating. So I say the proactive steps, strategically speaking, in protecting ourselves from terrorism are number one, to harden the most vulnerable targets, elementary schools, shopping districts, and college campuses by recognizing the primary tools of terrorism fire accelerants, bombs, vehicle attacks, and small arm and blade weapon attacks. Now, we also have reactive means of protecting ourselves, and this might surprise some of you. Collabor collaboration between multiple information gathering agencies should be leveraged at every possible opportunity. That is, once an attack happens, occurs, then we must leverage the information gathering agencies. By the way, you're thinking, well, that includes government intelligence agencies. Of course it does. Oh, and also police investigation agencies. Of course it does. But also journalism, news media, journalism. You think, well, that's not a big piece of the pie. I guarantee you it is. And if it's leveraged effectively, um, this provides another perspective of the terrorist threat and another warning, uh, a one more um, system to detect. Consider this. It's been just over 24, 36 hours uh, since Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was gunned down in Japan. And that's very, very, very sad. He was gunned down, of course, with a homemade, uh, appears to be a double barrel shotgun. The Japanese news media has yet to identify the assassin or the assassin's political ideology. Instead, they focused on the location, the timing, the targeting, and the methodology of the violent act. This behavior um, by the Japanese news media does not serve the terrorist goal of communicating their cause to a larger global audience. And so I think this is remarkably responsible. Now, I get it. I get it. I get it. The immediate knee-jerk reaction is to say, but the Japanese news media is censored by the government. That is correct. And I do not advocate that. I do not support that. I want the freedom of the press that is not controlled by government censorship. Government censorship. However, self-censorship in these situations is greatly beneficial to the efforts of defining what happened and detecting future attacks. And so for that reason, I truly wish that the American news media would follow models such as the Japanese news media in censoring themselves, not government, in censoring themselves, self-imposed, um, after these horrific violent acts. The reality is that the American news media are incredibly politically biased and that any of these violent attacks in America that might serve to further their narrative, their political agenda narrative, the news media leverages that um, just in a frenzy. And that's unfortunate. That it's, it's greatly unfortunate. By the way, I'm not picking on one side or the other. I'm recognizing that both the left and the right spectrum of news media in America do this. And there is essentially no centrist uh, center news agency. You can call them out and they'll be Republican leaning right or Democrat leaning left. There's nothing in the center. The closest that we get to that is perhaps social media, but certainly not news uh, journalism. This is unfortunate because if we could get them to be responsible and come back to the center, we would see uh, better detection um, and reporting, frankly on these horrific acts. That's kind of the strategic perspective of the question, is mass murder an act of terrorism? It is in most cases, but certainly not in all cases. Thank you.